And in breaking news, an historical... Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Ooh, can you guys see me? There we are. Okay, we took off the blue screen today, the green screen. How's everybody doing? Feel free to chime in if you wish. It's nice to see you all. And let's just get a quick hello to each one of you. I'm just gonna unpin for a moment just so we could say hi to everyone. So nice to see everybody, good morning to each and every one of you joining us here on Facebook Live, our various pages on YouTube, on Zoom. And I guess some of you might be watching this in the future. How do you like that? We could start talking to the future. And today I'm talking to the past because I'm talking to each of you who are present with me in the year right now live. So what we're going to do now today, how many of you remember the hippie movement? How many of you were around them? What was it like? Was there a local Woodstock back in the day? Here in South Africa, and I'm sure those who are watching us from overseas, you know, I come from New York. That's the headquarters of Woodstock, the hippie movement, which I know certainly had its impact here as well in South Africa. And in fact, it was a very good time in many ways because it was a time when many people returned to their roots, to their Yiddishkeit. Well, today we'll take a look at that in the in, in context of the Purim story and uh, glean some lessons from it. So please, at any moment, if you feel like it, chime in. Let us know your thoughts, your feelings, your opinion, your perspective. And we are one week away from Purim. Today is one week to Purim. And certainly Purim is a day we anticipate, we look forward to. As a kid, we, we sang that song. You know what that song is? Why don't we have Purim more often? Twice a week, at least twice a year. But this year we don't get Purim twice in the year. We get it once. And it's certainly a day of celebration. Although this year it's going to be very different than in the past because We've been wearing our masks a whole year. And this year, Purim, unfortunately, we still have to wear our mask. Usually it's novel to wear the mask on Purim, but this year it is not any longer novel coronavirus. But sadly, this pandemic has been with us for nearly a year. It was last year Purim when we experienced the first major wave, not here in South Africa. It took a couple of months till it reached us. As, as of everything, right? Things take time till they get here. But that's when, unfortunately, a lot of people overseas in larger Jewish communities uh, certainly were affected by the pandemic. So we're looking forward to Purim. We're looking forward to celebrate it in a normal way. 
And as part of our seniors program, please God, we will get Shalach Manas out to all of you. We will certainly have a virtual event here next Thursday. And those who are able to come join us live, we're going to have a drive-in Purim party at our shul. We're going to give you boxed food in the shul parking lot that you eat only in your car. We're going to have a big screen with interactive games and activities and uh, we'll have other things, of course, the Megillah reading, and we'll be able to fulfill all the mitzvahs of Purim. Now, please get on Monday. Monday's class, we'll, go into, we'll delve into the details of the mitzvahs of Purim and any halachas related to it so you can get prepared for your Purim celebrations properly. Certainly, to celebrate Purim properly, we have to understand the story, the history, and let's go back a little bit into remembering our salvation from the destruction, from Haman's plot, which was a plot that's been repeated so many times in our history to annihilate the Jewish people. And you know how the good old joke goes, how do you sum up every Jewish holiday? They tried to kill us, we won, let's eat. Well, thank God not only did we survive, but here we are, we are thriving as a Jewish community. And indeed to celebrate life, we eat, we drink, we're merry to show we're alive, thank God. But while food and drinking and celebrating are obviously relevant and a staple of every Jewish holiday, Purim obviously takes it to the next level. And what we're going to do today is we're going to look into the story of Purim. And we're going to see a little bit of the relevance of Purim. Why do we drink? Why do we imbibe ourselves? Is that the word? Imbibe ourselves. Why do we? Why is this holiday all the more so celebratory than some of the others? And we'll look through the Haggad, the Haggad, the Haggad is next month, the Megillah, and we'll look at some of the insights and perhaps look at the Talmud and learn some lessons for life from the Purim story for today as well. So let me start off. Unfortunately, I didn't prepare the actual texts in the slide today. So just bear with me. And I'm going to read a little passage from the Gemara. This is in the Gemara, the Talmud tractate Megillah that talks about the Purim story. Says the Gemara, Amar Rava, here's an interesting story from the Gemara. Mechayev inish libesume bepuria. On Purim, it is an obligation for men to imbibe themselves with wine. Wine is divine, right? To celebrate Purim, and to what degree? To the degree that you can't even tell the difference between Aurer Haman, cursed as Haman, and Baruch Mordechai, blessed as Mordechai. And the Gemara tells a story about two great sages, Rabba and Rabbi Zera. The two of them got together for their annual Purim festivities. And they're celebrating and they're drinking and they're having one lachaim after another. And listen to this crazy story. The Gemara says, Rabbi got up and he cut the throat of Rabbi Zera. And the next day when he sobered up and realized what he did, the Gemara says he prayed on behalf of Rabbi Zera and he was able to resurrect, to revive him. And the next year, when they got together, he said, uh, Rav Zera said to, or did Rav say to Rav Zera, will you honor me and come celebrate again in the, par- in the party? And Rav Zera's response, listen, a miracle doesn't happen every year. We got to be careful this time around. What's going on here? The truth is, this is a fascinating Talmudic story. There's many commentaries and discussions about the story and its messages and lessons. And it's something that I believe it's worthwhile to look into. And that's why I'm sharing it with you today. But by no means am I going to do an exhaustive exploration of the story. It is fascinating and worthwhile for you to study it and to look into it and to understand the significance of the story. But certainly it is a very interesting story. And the Talmud is telling us here about Purim. We get drunk. People get inebriated. And I'm not encouraging, I'm not, by the way, I'm not condoning that people get so intoxicated. We're just telling the story as it is. The Gemara is telling us that the extent of our drinking on Purim should be that we can no longer tell the difference between the most basic distinctions. Blessed is is Mordechai cursed as Haman. 
And the story goes on that, I mean, to such a degree, they were so intoxicated that one sliced the throat to the other, right? What's going on here? How can there be such a story in the Talmud? And we're telling us this, it seems like the Gemara is endorsing such intoxication to tell us such a story, albeit it tells us that Rabbi said, you know, we can't have these miracles, we can't rely on a miracle every year. But what's the meaning of the story? And is the Talmud encouraging intoxication, drinking to such an extent, to such a degree, that you can't tell the difference in curse does how many blessed does Mordechai? What does this mean? Why did the sages choose such a uh, extreme, fanatical way to tell us how to celebrate Purim that you should get so drunk, okay? Why would it be considered a good thing to be so drunk that you can't tell the difference between the evils of Haman and the virtues of Mordechai? Good question, right? Why did the sages, um, why is this included in the Talmud? You know, shouldn't we always know the difference between good and bad, virtuous and evil? Isn't that the what we should be doing? So many commentaries discuss this. And in fact, it's concluded by most that this story isn't a literal story that he actually murdered, that he actually um, sliced his friend's throat or killed him. But rather, there's, there's lessons and messages to us, and let's try to unpack it and understand it, okay? So the first commentary I want to share with you right now, let me just pick up my texts. Um, this one comes from the Avudraham, Rabbi David ben Yosef Avudraham. And just to give you a little bit of background into who he was, he was a 14th century sage in Spain, and is very famous for his work on Jewish prayers and blessings. And he discusses, it's basically a commentary on our prayers, on Shabbos, on daily prayers and festival prayers, all the different prayers. And he collects many customs and laws that relate to the Jewish prayers. So here he discusses this. And the first thing he tells us is, the story is not to be taken literally. Let me read it to you in his words, okay? He says, it's stated in the first chapter of Tract in Megillah that a person must be merry on Purim to the extent that you can't tell the difference between cursed as Haman and blessed as Mordechai, as we just discussed. So he says, some explain that the words cursed be Haman has the numerical value, the gematria of blessed be Mordechai. And we know numerology is, very, is, a, is a fascinating idea. And if you like numbers, you could study this. It's certainly fascinating. And the Talmud is telling us that a person should be so merry, so joyous to the extent that they can no longer make the calculation, the difference between one and the other. Basically, this is not a day for academics. Purim is a day to celebrate. Don't be worried about, does it add up? Does it not add up? So says the Abu Draham that the Talmud is referring to a certain, uh, a certain poem written in a responsive format. And for every stanza, the refrain would be either blessed be Mordechai or it would be cursed as Haman. Now this is basically, you know, Purim, a lot of shuls have a Purim spiel and different, you know, like interactive activities. In fact, please God, next Thursday, I'll do one of those fun activities with you. We'll do it in the form of a Kahoot game. And those who come to our Purim party, please God at our shul, which will be drive-in for everyone to be safe. We'll do some more Kahoot type of activities we're in in the works planning just to keep it interactive. So the Gemara is saying back in the day, they also used to have, you know, there was no Kahoot 2000 years ago. So they had their interaction and they had a poem and people would sing along and there were different stanzas. And so in response to one set of stanzas, you would say, blessed is Mordechai. And the response to the other set of stanzas, you would say, cursed is Haman. And it would go alternating back and forth. And you really needed a, a clear cup to keep track. You know, if you lose track, you, you don't pay attention. You can make a mistake and you're going to say the wrong thing. So the Avudraham 
this rabbi is telling us that the Talmud is just making a reference to this game. It was sort of like a, it's a, a number game or this poem, you know, the gematria of, of Baruch Mordechai and Ar Haman. Or it was this game that they would play and sing the songs back and forth. And basically what he's saying is that it's not necessarily a literal thing that you have to get so intoxicated that you really can't tell the difference between good and bad, virtuous and evil, uh, blessed as Haman, cursed as Mordechai. It's just illustrating this idea that you have to drink to the point that you're so joyous, you're so merry that you can't even keep track in this game of the you know, sophisticated calculations of, of, of the poem to remember which one's which. And it should be fun. Okay, this is one perspective on the story that Purim is just let loose. We're not saying that a person has to get so tipsy that you have to, uh, to the extent that you might cut the throat of your friend. But perhaps that's just answering. He, he doesn't even talk about that story. He doesn't even touch on that. He just tells us that, this, that the idea is that it's, uh, that you're supposed to have fun on Purim. The question is, is this really the case not to tell the difference between cursed and, and blessed, between good and evil? And I don't think that's a Jewish perspective. And I don't think that's the point he's making. We're just going to dissect this together. So indeed, Purim, we got to be happy. But now the question is, do you have to get drunk? Yeah, is that the point? And I know that certainly as a medic, who has been uh, volunteering with Hatzalah for more than 10 years, I can tell you Purim sometimes gets a little bit out of hand. And I certainly would be the last person to encourage people to be drinking to intoxication on Purim. Okay, uh, let me be clear about that. But we're analyzing the Talmud here and we're trying to understand what it is that the Talmud is trying to tell us because drinking in general is, is not such a Jewish thing. But here the Talmud seems to be encouraging it. Okay, now there are other ways, there are various commentaries on the Talmud, so I put together a few for today's discussion, and let's try to look at them, and analyze them, and discuss them, and hopefully we can come up with a, with a good understanding, okay? So let me share with you another one, this one comes from the Rama. The Rama, you might know, is an acronym for Ramosha Isilis, he was a rabbi in the 1500s, he in fact wrote... Jewish law at the same time as Rabbi Yosef Cairo was writing the Shulchan Aruch. Shulchan Aruch is the code of Jewish law. And when it came to the realization that they pretty much wrote the same book, except that the Shulchan Aruch means the table. He wrote, his book was called the Mapa, which means the table cloth. They basically conglomerated, they worked, put their books together. And what you have is the Shulchan Aruch that's written by the Mechaber, the author known, his name was Rabbi Yosef Cairo. He was the author. And the Ramah, Rabbi Yosef who was a Polish rabbi in Krakow, Rabbi Yosef, rabbi Yosef Cairo was in Israel, in Tzfat, whereas Rabbi Moshe Isilis was in Poland. And they basically put the work together. And what we could see is the difference of opinion sometimes. Rabbi Yosef Cairo was Sephardic. Rabbi Moshe Isilis was Ashkenaz, European. So uh, when you read the Shulchan Aruch, you could see the difference of opinion between how Sephardic Mediterranean Jews observed laws and the way European Jews, Ashkenaz. And it wasn't that different, but there are some differences and it's all included in the book. So this is, that was the Ramah. What does he say? Let me read his words to you. He says, yes, Omrim, there are some of the opinion, some suggest, that there's no need to get so drunk, so inebriated. Rather he's saying, drink, a little bit more than what you're used to. And you can, you know, if you fall asleep, fine. And when, while you're sleeping, he says, of course you don't know the difference between Araham and Baruch Mordechai, between blessed as Haman and, and, and cursed as Mordechai. You know, God forbid, but the point he's trying to say is, is that while you're sleeping, you can tell the difference. And his point is, he concludes, Regardless, for one who increases or one who adds, the important thing is that you should be joyous for the sake of heaven. So the point is not to drink, he's, according to him. In fact, it sounds like he's saying you should sleep. Personally, I think sleep is a waste of, of, of time. 
Uh, that's why I, I, I struggle in the mornings and I have to get a couple of these to get me going for the day. But, you know, for many people, even a glass of wine is going to make them a bit drowsy. Um, if you belong to the right crowd and the right shul, the right people, then you can have a nice uh, dop, a good lechayim. And, uh, you know, here in South Africa, it seems like the, the, the Lithuania, the Eastern European uh, tradition is to have some, a nice couple of lechayims. And if you can handle it, great. But the point I think that he is making is that it's not that you have to get drunk, but just drink a little bit more than you're used to. That's what the Rama seems to indicate. Of course, the question that comes to mind is, you know, you read this and you understand the Talmud's words. The Talmud is pretty much making it clear that you should get silly drunk. So how's the Rama saying, you don't have to get so drunk. Now, again, I also say you don't have to get so drunk, but we're trying to analyze the perspectives. So we have so far the Abu Rahman is saying the story is not literally saying they played a game, you should drink, you shouldn't be able to tell the difference, just have fun, be merry, be joyous on this day. Then we have the Ramo saying drink a little bit more than usual, but you don't have to get plastered. Let me share with you another commentary. This one is from the Taz. The Taz is a great sage known as uh, the acronym of his, of his book was Ture Zahav, which Ture Zahav, um, it's a, a very important commentary on, on Shulchan Aruch, on the Talmud. It was written, he's known as the Taz, but his name was actually Rabbi David Halevi Segal. Okay, but he called his book Ture Zahav. Acro- Again, that spells, it's the acronym of Taz. So he, and he also lived a similar time, I think a little bit after the Ramah. The point is he was a great European Jewish scholar, a great rabbi. And um, he says, he says as follows. Let me read his commentary to you. Okay, hold with me. Let me just find it quickly. Here we go. He says, how could we, he's actually arguing against his, predecessor, the Ramah, he says, how can we do away with the words of the Talmud? Talmud says, you have to get drunk to the extent that you can't tell the difference between cursed as Haman, blessed as Mordechai. He says that from the Talmud, it seems very clear that you should get drunk. But he says, we see that right after that, the Talmud concludes with a story about Rabbah killing Rab Zera and having to revive him. So he's saying that if that's the case, Maybe the Talmud is warning us against getting drunk. Maybe he's like skillfully killing two birds with one stone. He's explaining the Ramah's position. He's asking, could we really do away with a Talmudic statement that you should get intoxicated? And then he explains, of course, the Talmud follows up the story of Rabbi Rabbi Zerah. So he's telling us the Talmud specifically bringing up that story to show us the results of people who get so intoxicated. Okay. You know, maybe you should just take a schnapps, go to sleep, and that will take care of the differentiating. You know, you won't have to make too many calculations that way. Now, of course, while we read these Talmudic commentaries, and it's very, very nice, but still, it's, uh, it seems there's the stories in the Talmud, and the fact remains that if you simply read the Talmudic statement, the Talmud seems to be encouraging intoxication. Yes, I read to you three commentaries here who say that it doesn't have to be taken literally, right? But how do we reconcile the face value of the Talmudic words versus the commentaries? You know, the, the anti-Semites like to call it Hasbara. You know, that's like uh, PR. You're trying to explain away. At the end of the day, Haman was a ruthless power monger. He was a self-centered, narcissistic egomaniac, as we talked about in Tuesday's class. He was a barbarian who schemed to exterminate, to annihilate, to completely eliminate the Jewish people. Every single one of us, every Jew living in the Persian Empire, which which the, the Megillah tells us how vast, how big it was, he was the Hitler of his day. Mordechai, on the other hand, was the savior, he was the great sage, a genuine leader, a lover of God, a lover of his people, of humanity. He was one who stood strong and tall against Haman. So it seems obvious 
that a decent human being should never forget that Haman must be cursed, that Mordechai be blessed. Why would the Talmud even say such a thing? We have to know our moral standing, shouldn't we? Don't we say never again? We have to know the moral equations between monsters and good people. And I know that these days sometimes monsters are looked up to. We live in a crazy world. But regardless of that, how would the Talmud even seem to indicate that we should have known the difference between the two? And, you know, even stranger is that we're, that the Talmud is telling us that not only should we forget it on Purim, this is the day that we celebrate our victory, our deliverance from Haman's evil plot against us. When we should be celebrating Mordechai's leadership. The whole point of Purim is the fall of Haman, the rise of Mordechai, how we were saved. So why would the Talmud seem to be indicating that we shouldn't tell the, that we can't distinguish between them? So what are we going to do? How are we going to figure this out? Well, the short version of the Purim story is that we know King Ahasuerus, my, I remember that song from my childhood. I hear my kids singing it today. Made a great feast. Called his wife Vashti to come. She had many pimples, 100 at least. She said, I can join in your fun. The king got so angry, he said to his gods, take her. I don't want her. She's me. And of all the Hamans and all the other maidens that Shushan town had, Esther became the new queen. Who advised them to kill Vashti? His wicked advisor, Haman. And then we know that Haman contrives this plot to have all the Jews killed. And Ahasuerus kills Haman on the advice of his new wife, Esther. All right, we're not going to go into the whole story now. We know the story in short that Esther, that Mordechai influences Esther and the tables are turned and the Jewish people are saved. Let's eat. Let's celebrate. Right? That's, that's the story in a nutshell. But then you have the behind the scenes story. And the Medrash tells us of a whole subscript that isn't mentioned anywhere in the Megillah. But it certainly adds layers and layers of, of nuance, of perspective, of meaning, of understanding to the whole story, to the plot, to the scheme, to the victory. So to get the full picture, the first thing we need to know is the fact, and this is mentioned in the Talmud and in the Medrash, that Mordechai was not only a leader of the Jewish people, and a member of the Sanhedrin and the Anche Knesset Sagdola, he was actually a member of the Persian government. By the way, to this very day, I know that Iran is not on good terms with Israel, and they oftentimes make it very clear their intentions to wipe Israel off the map. What's very interesting that as a country, Iran gives representation to all of its denominations ostensibly, even to the Jews. And the sad irony of it all is, they don't give them freedom of speech because if you recall during some of the um, wars between Israel and Hamas and whatever, that the, 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 the Jewish members of the Persian parliament had to speak out against Israel. Which I'm not quite sure if that was independent or coerced, but whatever the case is, back in those days, Mordechai was also a member of the Persian government. And so that's one point we have to know. The second thing that comes to mind is that we, we need to know that although Haman eventually reached the heights of power, he actually came from very low beginnings. And if you were at the Shir last week, we talked about this idea that Haman was actually a barber back in the day, as the Gemara tells us. And for many years, he was a barber. And somehow the poor barber got himself a job in the government as well. And that's where he met with Mordechai long before the Purim story took place. 
And Mordechai and Haman, they actually had a long, complicated history going back a long time where Haman owed Mordechai a favor. And it's sort of like why he had, he harbored these, this uh, hatred, animosity towards him. You know, people don't like owing others favors. So the Gemara tells the story that once it happened, that the king sent Mordechai and Haman on a mission to conquer a certain territory and gave them some money. Haman took his portion of the money, spent it all, squandered the money away. Remember yesterday's story. And when they arrived and needed to spend the money on their battle, on their war, (laughs) Haman and nothing left, the Gemara says. But Mordechai still had half of his money. So Haman approached Mordechai and asked him, he said, please let me some of your money. Mordechai said, well, we have to have an arrangement. And this is where, since Mordechai saved Haman, Haman had felt like, you know, owing a favor. And he had this, this animosity towards him. Okay. And the Gemara continues. If you look at the words of the Megillah, where Haman says, when he, when he reflects on his wealth and his fame and all of his, you know, think about how many he's had so much going for him. Go back to Monday's shear where we did, or Tuesday's shear where we discussed in great detail how wealth he was fabulously wealthy. He, had, he was popular. He was worshipped by the people. And yet, he says, it's worthless to me when this Mordechai, when I see his existence. And the, the Gemara says, when Haman saw Mordechai sitting at the king's gate, he says, uh uh-uh. Can't stand this guy. Despised him. So the Gemara concludes there that the fact that Haman owed Mordechai a favor all the more so aggravated him. It angered him. And so if we have that perspective and understanding of the story, it's clear that Haman's eventual rise to power wasn't actually something to be taken for granted considering his background, where he came from. You know, it was quite unlikely that such a person would reach such great heights. And even when Haman did manage to carve out his position that he became, you know, first a minor minister and all the way up till he became the prime minister of of Persia, of the Persian empire, it was something that sort of wasn't anticipated or expected. And you go back into the story and analyze where, where Vashti rebels and she doesn't want to show up to the party in her birthday suit as Ahasuerus demanded so he could show off his beautiful wife. And he confers with all his ministers. And it's Haman who recommended to behead her. It's Haman who says, do away with her. And not only that, to send out a message that this is the reason that she refused to listen to her husband's order. Because otherwise, all women in this country are going to stand up. You know, it reminds me of, of Rosa Parks. You all know of Rosa Parks? She stood up against discrimination, the civil rights movement. She was the one who stood, who, who sparked that whole movement in America. They were afraid of women's rights in Persia back then. So it is Haman, and we read this in the Megillah, who says, Not only against King Ahasuerus is Vashti rebelling by not showing up in her nakedness nude, but against all the men in the kingdom. So it's Haman who came up with this, with this advice to do away with her. And that's how he rose to his popularity. He was power hungry. So instead of sitting back and seeing how the king Al will work this out with his wife, 
he right away says, "Uh uh-uh, you got to do something with her. So because he promoted himself here, he had the solution. And Ahasuerus being intoxicated, listen to him. And he said, oh my gosh, what happened to my wife? So Haman, here he's rising on the, on the, on the ladder of influence. And Ahasuerus listened to him. Which at the same time as it's negative, as he put the whole story together, you know, in, in the story of the Megillah, we don't see God's name. The story of, of Purim is one which shows us within the natural order how things work out. And it's only in hindsight that you put all the pieces of the puzzle together. So while on the one hand, it, it seems crazy that the king listened to this evil man and killed Vashti. But in hindsight, you look at all the pieces of, of, of the story, how they come together, that it was only through that that Esther winds up becoming the king's new wife. And it's only through that that, that she, being the niece of Mordechai, is able to help save the Jewish people from Hava's evil plot. Everything comes together. At that stage, there was no problem. Jewish people had the religious freedom. They had their own representative in the government, Mordechai. Everything you could say all in all, the Jews were doing okay. There was no reason to suspect that all of a sudden they, they soon would need to be saved from this whole plot. Who would have expected it? But then all of a sudden, all of a sudden things go crazy. So here you have Haman on the one hand, coming from his background and everything seems to be all fine and dandy. And all of a sudden Haman's appointed to this position after he advises to behead Vashti. And then he slowly or quickly rises to power and he convinces Ahasuerus to annihilate the Jewish people. And within months, all of a sudden things are starting to go crazy. The Jews don't even know what's going to be there. Their extermination is, is coming soon. And miraculously, I mean, there's obviously now that we could piece the, the, the puzzle together. We see the whole dramatic turn of events. Haman's killed and the Jews are saved. And all of a sudden, instead of Haman being the uh, important, it's Mordechai that's, that's exalted and becomes the, the viceroy. He's, he's promoted into Haman's position. All that, and we read it in the, in the, in the Megillah. I'm going to read it again next week. All of a sudden, how everything, the whole turn of events. So what's the meaning of all this drama? How did this lowly, wicked Hama, who came from humble beginnings, from being a barber, how does he rise up all of a sudden, so suddenly? And how did the Jewish people, with such a righteous, noble leader as Mordechai, fall into such danger? How is it possible for such a stable world where good is recognized as good, everyone knew Mordechai as the righteous person, and evil is, is recognized as evil. Everyone knew Haman was who he was. How did everything just like that turn upside down? What was going on? And come to think about it, how did this story help anyone? You know, before the Purim story, Haman was nothing and everyone, all the Jewish people were doing fine. After the story, Haman's gone. And again, we're doing fine. Obviously, many other events throughout our history. So what was really gained by the crazy, terrifying trials and tribulations that took place in the horror, in the drama of this Purim story? I'm not saying nothing was gained, but I'm saying like, what's the key difference between pre-Purim and, and post-Purim? We got rid of Haman. Haman came in the middle, gave us a scare. Right before the whole Purim crisis, Haman was a no one. All of a sudden, he's promoted to this great position of power. And then he's eliminated. And Mordechai is elevated to the greatest position. What is going on here? What's the significance of the story? What, what's it about? Is it all that Mordechai should be promoted to power? 
promotions, demotions. It's, it's, it's intriguing, no doubt. But was the whole purpose of the Purim story to give Mordechai this, this uh, promotion and, and, and have a pay cut? And the truth is, there is some great insight. I want to share with you an insight from the Rebbe's teachings that I think you'll find relevant and will learn a, an important message and lesson. Because ultimately, this whole story, obviously, there's a purpose behind it. And we read the Megillah every year. And it's not just an incident, an event that happened, and everything afterwards was the same as before. What Haman stood for, and what Mordechai stood for, and that wide gulf between them is what we have to analyze in the story of the Megillah. And essentially, right there in the Megillah is a story of national intoxication. The world was drunk to the point that it couldn't distinguish between the goodness of Mordechai and the evil of Hama. The good news is that out of that drunkenness, we have a new reality. So it's not just everything is the same after as it was before. Let's try to understand and unpack the story and so we could really understand the difference between cursed as Haman and blessed as Mordechai. Of course, on Purim, we have to distinguish between good and evil. But we also have to challenge ourselves, our understanding of that distinction. We have to ensure that our rejection of Haman, our embrace of Mordechai, our removal of bad, our, our promotion of good, is real, is meaningful. Not just out of habit, this is good, this is bad, or social norms. Oftentimes, that can't happen until there's a break in the establishment as we know it. What coronavirus did for us this past year made such a difference to put things into perspective. And this is perhaps the idea of why the Gemara tells us Ad Yoda, which is the theme of Purim. Ad Yoda, Ad Yoda. We sing about it. The idea of Ad Yoda, that you have to get so intoxicated that you can't tell the difference. When we forget everything we know about good and evil, so that we can become open to a higher consciousness, to a higher recognition of what good and evil are and what they stand for. That's the purpose of Adel Yada. That's the purpose of this whole theme of Purim. So I told you that we'll talk a little bit about hippies, right? Let's try the way I could illustrate this to you is by sharing with you a little insight that the Rebbe took from the hippies movement in the 1960s, in the uh, late 60s. And I think it was what, 69 or 70, when that whole Woodstock was going on, music and everything else that was happening. And, you know, many people see that whole hippies movement of the 60s and 70s as a rebellion of the youth. What was going on during that time? Right? What was, what was happening? What was, the, what, was the, what was the hippies movement about? And just reading a little bit of the Rebbe's insight into this, I think it answer our questions of why all the drama and the Purim story, what it's all about, and its message for us. Okay, so you think about the hippie movement where people just dressed funny and bell bottoms became popular and, and the long hair and all, the, all that. What was it about? where people were uh, high, getting high on drugs and free love, right? What else was going on? And I wasn't around. You have to tell me. Anyone want to chime in and tell us a little bit about the hippies movement? The music, all those. It was a, a very interesting era. Certainly gave a lot of grief to parents and teachers. Uh, it was shocking what was going on. And while a lot of people saw it as like some kind of a revolution that was happening, with all that drug abuse and uh, sexual conduct and all the things 
that was going on at the time, people wondered, why did an entire generation of young and bright people reject the normalcy of the time, you know, the sensible path of their parents and grandparents? Was it just uh, an expression of their immaturity? Was it a change? What were they looking for? What was it about? And to tell you the truth, I'm sure there's lots of perspectives on that, but when you read the Rebbe's perspective, it's unique. And he says that it was actually on Purim that the Rebbe spoke about this in 1970, and he puts it into a whole different perspective, a different light. And he explained that just as in the Purim story, there were two different states of differentiating between cursed as Haman and blessed as Mordechai, that we discussed before, the murky differentiation um, before the crisis of the Purim story and afterwards, what was the difference? But that crystallized the, the, the distinction between good and evil. There are two levels of consciousness that we can distinguish in our lives. And the first is pragmatic and materialistic. And the second is soulful and eternal. So from a very pragmatic and materialistic world outlook, Haman's path has to be rejected. Mordechai's lifestyle, that's the one we should follow. Now, what, is, what does that mean? You know, many parents tell their kids, if you want to get a good job, if you want to get into a good university, you should stay away from drugs and alcohol. If you want to generate a good income, live in a beautiful house and uh, have a good holidays and whatever else, have nice cars, own a second home at the Ball or in Kruger or in Schlanger or Platt, wherever it is. Well, you got to wake up early in the morning, put in a full day's work at, at the office, be loyal to your spouse, stay away from dangerous behavior, be a mensch like Mordechai, so to say. The world will smile. Everything's going to be good. If you be a Haman, forget about it. Right? You're going to bring shame to yourself, to your family, to your community. And certainly that's a nice vision. And certainly that's one that, that promotes law and decency and hard work and, and faithful family commitments. Right? This, this is something that certainly we should keep in mind that it's, it's a good moral, ethical way to live. But that's something from the Rebbe's interpretation of the whole hippies movement that was rejected by the youngsters of the 60s against the establishment. They, why they all of a sudden embraced that whole new lifestyle of, uh, that, that was frivolous that they just wanted unlimited sex and drugs and alcohol and, 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 and acid trips and whatever else. What went wrong? What was wrong with a normal good lifestyle? And so the Rebbe explained that as good as it sounds, that outlook on life is still very, um, it's based on self-interest. It's narcissistic. It's about self-gain, okay? The evil of Haman is bad for me, so that's why I'm going to avoid it. The goodness of Mordechai is good for me, so that's why I'm going to embrace it. I'm going to pursue a good lifestyle that's noble, that's, that's ethical, that's moral, because it's good for me, that I can have a good job, that I can make money, that I have a nice home, that I'll be educated, that I'll go on holidays and all that. But is that really the full scope of the difference between blessed as Haman and cursed as Marduk. <laughs> you see, I'm already, I'm already drunk. A little Red Bull. Right? Is the only thing wrong with being a Haman the fact that it's going to deny you a, a luxurious retirement? Is that the reason we should be cautious not to behave in that way? So you won't have a fancy car and have an extra home? So you won't make a lot of money? What about the idealistic chords of, of just being good for the sake of being good? What about 
the passion for truth, the dedication to just being normal, noble human beings. So the real virtue of Mardachai, that's not a, it's not about, you know, what, what, what kind of, um, what kind of lifestyle I'm going to get. That's an empty interpretation. The real idea is, am I living my life with purpose for higher calling? We have to be like Mordechai because choosing good is the whole reason that we were put in here to begin with. There's a creator in this world who has a plan. And only if we tap into that divine plan does our life truly have meaning and value and purpose. Of course, Haman is to be eliminated as chewed. What, what greater travesty could there be in the world than living a Haman type life? We have a God given soul. We know that we're indispensable to the divine plan. How could I behave in the Haman way that we discussed in Tuesday's share, which is all about narcissism, ego, self centeredness, about hedonistic pleasures? Of course, we have to avoid that at all costs. That negates the very existence, the very essence of, of why we exist and how we exist. So if we're just living on the very plain, simple understanding that this is good for myself and my family and my income and all that, then it reduces us to just soul machine, you know, what do I say, call it, we become like robots. We don't know the difference between good and bad. It's just about what, how it benefits me. It's not about uh, the spiritual yearning, not about what's really, truly right. We have to realize we're not only animals searching for self-gratification, self-aggrandizement. We're souls. We, we don't just care about our capitalistic and um, secure financial future. What about deeper meaning in life? So when the distinction between cursed as Haman and blessed as Mordechai is only on materialistic self uh, financial gain, self-serving, then we, that's why it was rejected. That was so to say the American dream at the time. Have a nice car, nice house. Travel the world. But that's a flawed distinction between Haman and Mordechai. That's, not, that's why there was a rebellion of the youth and from the Rebbe's perspective. They were rejecting the superficial distinction between Haman and Mordechai because that didn't resonate with their deep, sensitive souls that wanted something more meaningful than that. Morality has to speak in the, in the name of truth and depth, not in the name of shallow narcissistic benefits. And that's what was being rejected. Like in the Purim story, the erosion of moral boundaries was a terrifying prospect. And many people all of a sudden said, what's going on? You know, wringing their hands, what's, what's going to be? What's going to become of, of this generation? But the rabbi looked at it a different way. He saw that what the hippies were doing was tearing apart the fabric of society, not in a negative way, saying we want something more meaningful, something more purposeful. If you think about that era, there was a whole Balchuva movement. Many people started getting more religiously involved during that time. The Rebbe saw a tremendous opportunity and responsibility that he told his shluchim. Look what came out of the Purim crisis. Learn from the Purim story. Yes, for a time, there was a breakdown of the boundaries of good and evil, but that was a crucial stepping stone towards making those boundaries even stronger and more recognizable that it's not just about materialistic distinctions. Our responsibility is to make sure not to get stuck in the crisis, but to rise above it, to find that real meaning and purpose, to teach the young people the honest truth about our purpose in life, that they learn to appreciate the boundaries, not just as, okay, I want to make my parents happy. The Rebbe believed that we have the opportunity to teach the youth about the true, profound distinction between two lifestyles, two philosophies, about the soul's awareness 
that were created for a greater purpose. That the goodness and kindness and morality is, that's based on Torah values, that indeed is something that, 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 that's the greatest. And that's where he saw the opportunity. So from that whole hippies movement, there was actually a tremendous lesson that could be learned. And you think about those days, and uh, you know, again, I wasn't around then, but certainly a lot of good did come from it. And so I think that if we're looking today, the Rebbe said we could learn from the passion and the excitement, the energy that the hippies had. And certainly that influenced the next generation. When you look at the Balchuva movement of how many people be became more aware of the religious and spiritual identity at that time, there was something tremendously great that came out as a result of it. And that's what, that's what the Rebbe looked at this story. And so I think as we are talking here about the Purim story today, we have to try to glean that message as well, what we could learn from the hippies movement to see the positive that came out of the negative. Yes, perhaps there were some negative things that resulted in that whole hippies movement. I'm sure there, that, that uh, there were challenges and difficulties and all that. But if we could take the good that came out of it, the Rebbe put it as the chutzpah of the youth that frustrated their parents, that shook things up. But ultimately, it, 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 it resulted in a whole better change for the better of society. And so the same thing we could say if we're looking at the Purim story. Yes, in the Purim story, there was, at, the, at first, you could say, you know, the lines between good and evil were blurred. The fabric of society was torn apart, but then it was re-sown. And we need to replace those superficial boundaries with real meaning and purpose in our lives as well. And this is perhaps the message and lesson we could take from this whole Purim story and apply to our lives as well. That the last thing the youth care about maybe is what you think of them. That was what the hippies said. Who cares what society thinks of me, okay? And the Rebbe said, well, look at the youth. They're getting things done. They have that energy. Never discourage them from standing up enjoying making the best of life for themselves. And I think each one of us are young at heart. And so we have that inner spark of youth inside ourselves. And our job is to awaken that spark, to feel fresh passion for our Judaism, to, to spread the passion to others as well. And take that chutzpah of the youth in those days not to see it as a challenge, but as a unique opportunity. And if we could just tap into that, then I think we could take some of the messages and lessons in the Purim story, apply it in our own lives as well, realize that when you get dressed up next week for Purim, yes, it's a good thing, get dressed up, put on some fancy dress. Monday we'll talk about why we do that. And go back into your, your own youth. Be a youth again. Don't be intimidated by the world around you, but tap into that energy and channel it in the right direction. That's the Purim story in short. Why do we get drunk? Well, I'm not going to tell you if to get drunk or not, but certainly if you get drunk spiritually, and spiritually is a pun intended, then we could all benefit in very many ways to see things from a new perspective. Don't see it the old way. There was a big difference between the way it was before the Purim story and after. And likewise, in our lives, when we tap into the energy around us, there should be a big difference between pre-corona, post-corona, because now we're entering the post-corona era. And let's, please God, you know, the second wave is over. Let's not get a third wave with Purim. Be careful, but let's ensure that we learn the lessons. Like in the Purim story, the way the Rebbe unpacked it and showed us how to learn the difference between before and after. We also have to learn the differences 
in our lives, what was it like before last Purim and as it is now? I think we've learned heck of a lot in this past year. And let's apply those lessons. Maybe let's talk about those lessons. Perhaps in the next year, we could start off with some discussion about what lessons Corona taught you and how you applied them in your life. Any questions before we conclude? Come on, guys. All right, with that, I wish you a wonderful day. Zaykazun, God bless you. Cheers, be well, and see you next week.